From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 65, recorded on February 15th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Got snow no up there, snow Cindy? No snow in Ithaca. No, none, zero. We can see the grass. It's very weird. Mm, it's very it. strange. It's it for snow. Yeah. From, it was like 60 degrees yesterday. It's yeah, it's a warm spell, but it'll get cold again, I guess. Yeah. Also joining us from Cleveland, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hi there. Great to be here. Yeah, I was going to comment on the warm weather we're having too. It's been a warm-ish winter. I Coming from Duke, I thought I was, you know, in for it, but it's not been bad. From Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Great to see everybody. Yeah, I think we're setting records for lack of snow and warmth this winter here. <laughs> We have a guest for you today from Points North, Harvard Medical School. Harvard Medical School. I, I have to edit that out because I said Harvard Medical Stool, which wouldn't be good, right? <laughs> Harvard <laughs> from Harvard Medical School, Jonathan Kagan. Welcome to Immune. Hello, everyone. Thanks for thanks for having me. And you know, the the stool reference may be aft because I do work in a gastroenterology division. So that's, that's true. You my are colleagues will be very pleased as a gastroenterologist in many publications. So there you go. Huh. <laughs> so you're the Marion Nutra Professor of Pediatrics. I met her years ago. Yeah, Marion is uh, is a fantastic scientist. She was uh, just winding down her lab when I was starting mine back in 2007, and she stayed on for many years as a effectively a sage to the junior junior faculty. And as some of you may know, Marion, uh, her claim to fame is that she was one of the discoverers of M cells in the intestine, mm-hmm. which is so important for many different host microbe interactions. Yeah, so I, I remember uh, when Bernie Fields was around, he was always talking about Marion and he said, go, go look at her work. It's really important for viruses. I met her at a meeting in, I think it was Italy, many years ago. Very interesting person. Oh. She is. In fact, she's the first person to connect me with other faculty on Harvard's campus who work on viruses, mm. including Max yeah. Nybert, who was one of Bernie Fields' That's star right. Our students. That's right. And uh, she and I were chatting one day, and I mentioned, as Cindy would know, a lot of us innate immunity folks use poly IC as our virus. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and I had mentioned, we probably should start doing something with real viruses, but I don't know how to do that. And about 10 minutes later, I received an email to Max saying, Max, you should call John. He needs to, to learn how to do this. And that ended up being our first paper from, uh, from my nascent lab. Mm. Yeah, I remember Marion also worked with. Marie Chow, who uh, was a postdoc with me uh, many years ago at MIT. And um, so it seemed like she was good at bringing people together. Yeah, Indeed. Well, Jonathan, we're going to talk a little bit about your work today, but we'd love to start by uh, hearing your history. Where, where did you start out? Where are you from and where were you educated? Sure. So I grew up in New York, about an hour east of New York City on Long Island. You can always recognize people who are from Long Island because they don't say they they grew up in Long Island. You say, I grew up in New York. I grew up in Chicago, in California, but you grew up on Long Island. Well, you also have an I accent, you know. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I... I what grew up part in a of Long small Island? What part of Long Island? Small town known as Farmingville, New York, yeah. which is home to the highest point, actually, above sea level of, of the, uh, the island itself. Wow. My father was a, a very well respected executive at MetLife and United Health Group. My mother, when we were kids, uh, stayed at home with us, um, but she also has an entrepreneurial spirit and started a company in the 80s that continues today, where she um, you know, decorates for parties, either private or corporate corporate events. Mm-hmm. She's probably one of the most um, popular people in the region of New York. Everybody everybody loves and and, mm-hmm. and knows her, as do her does her family, of course. Um, you know, I bring I bring this up because not only did they, um, neither of them were trained as scientists, but they effectively instilled within, within me some of the traits that I would argue are the least quantifiable, yet best represented and successful 
scientist. And that is one, an entrepreneurial spirit, someone who cares very deeply about the future, not just themselves. And any good parent, of course, takes a lot of pride in the way their, their children turn out. And, uh, and also are curious, genuinely curious and enthusiastic people. And these traits, um, I try to, you know, represent in, in myself and I, I owe it greatly to my parents uh, for that. And it's something that I try to pay forward with the people in my lab. Nowhere was science in my, hmm. in my upbringing. Um, I liked biology. I thought it was a, let's just say a cool subject and, um, but nothing where I thought that there was a career in it. In fact, most of my childhood was spent playing sports, um, you know, running around, you know, kicking the football, soccer, lacrosse. I loved baseball, but I was terrible at it. I still love baseball and I'm still terrible mm -hmm. at it. Um, but my heart was was in the sport of wrestling. And in fact, I spent okay. most of my time in, in high school and most of college um, with that on my mind. I ended up going to a small liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania known as Bucknell University. Yep. Very... Um, fantastic environment, completely different than anything in, in the New York City, Long Island area. Because where I grew up, every exit on the highway was a mile away. But as we were driving out to Central PA and I <laughs> asked my parents how many more exits, they said 15 more exits. And I said, oh, we'll be there in 20 minutes. And they said, no, you didn't realize that out here, each exit is 15 miles. <laughs> so we'll be there in a few hours. Um, Bucknell is in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Mm. One bar, one restaurant, wow. ton of really interesting, challenged and challenging people, people who really are hungry for, um, for social interactions, creativity, and mostly a business and engineering school. But there's about 80 students in each class that are biology majors. Maybe two of them want to be scientists. Wow. Hmm. And it wasn't until my junior year in college that I even realized that a career in science was, was possible. Hmm. And I remember coming home at the end of my junior year, my parents said, you know, what are you going to do with your life? <laughs> and I had said, uh, well, I just started doing research and I kind of like it. Maybe I should go to graduate school. And, you know, Bucknell, which is such a wonderful place, is also a private school. And my parents kind of thought, OK, well, how much does that cost to go to graduate <laughs> school? <laughs> and I said, I have no idea. And they said, find out. <laughs> so I come back a few weeks later and I say, guess what? graduate school is free and they pay you. And <laughs> my father, who is not someone who, um, well, I should say he's very verbose. He loves to talk. He paused for a minute or so in the living room and he turned to me and he said, I will pay for every application. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> then you're on your own. <laughs> and, uh, and so I ended up going to, to graduate school. And, uh, and I should say that I was fortunate that I fell in love with a job that I was actually good at. I did not really have an understanding of what life as a scientist was. And in fact, these days, of course, people want to plan out much more of their life than, than what I, and I would argue many others of, of my generation did. Many of us kind of followed their nose and hoped for the best. And I do think that if you are working on something that you're excited about, then the best is more likely to reveal themselves, reveal itself. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working as a graduate student in the lab of Craig Roy. It was myself and um, Debbie Zuckman and Miguelina Matthews, Miggy Matthews. Us three were the first students in Craig Roy's lab. And, um, you know, we rotated together. We joined the lab together. We worked together um, and we graduated together. And it was a fantastic environment working with a brand new PI because Craig, my boss, um, who I consider to be the best experimentalists I've ever, I've ever met, would, was also very into the details early on. And so we would be in lab at eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, watching the agarose gels running, saying, <laughs> how big do you think that band's going to be? Do you think it's going to be 800 base pairs or 900 base pairs? I don't know. What do you think? You know, the details that you want to get excited about. And we were thrilled with things like cesium chloride preps because the band was so bright when you pulled it off the gradient and things like that. And I was studying how bacteria infect macrophages, the bacterium legionella pneumophila. And uh, at the time, 
there was a lot of attention paid to how bacteria invade cells. Um, Yersinia was the first with, with the protein invasion identified by Ralph Isberg when he was in Stan Falco's lab. Um, but there are many other invasion-like proteins, in particular the type 3 secretion system that so many, including Jorge Gilan, characterized in Salmonella, which promoted entry into cells. And the nifty thing about Legionella research was that Legionella didn't do anything special to enter cells, but what it did was live within the cell. And the question with Legionella was, how is it that it's capable to survive within a macrophage whose job really is to shred everything that it, that it eats? Mm-hmm. And my thesis project in, the, in, that, in that lab was to try to identify some of the strategies that Legionella takes to live within macrophages and prevent being killed. And it was really a wonderful environment. Um, by complete chance, I was in the first class of students in, at Yale, where, where I did my, um, the vast majority of my graduate studies, when the nascent Department of Microbial Pathogenesis was founded. So you may remember in the, in the 1970s, the U.S. Surgeon General had said, like, the age of infectious diseases is over. We have <laughs> antibiotics and we're good. <laughs> and Yale- I quoted and, that in class yesterday. <laughs> did you really? Did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible, right? When you think back on that, you think, you know, how much we thought we knew and how much there was still to learn. And, uh, and Yale shut down their micro program largely in the 70s and 80s. And it wasn't until the mid to late 90s that it was rebooted with this microbial pathogenesis department, that Jorge Galam was the, the chair. Craig Roy, my thesis advisor, was um, one of the founding members, as was Norma Andrews, who's one of the you know giants in the trypanosome and leishmania fields. And because it was a new field, because it was new for me to be kind of working as a scientist, everything was exciting. And we all had joint lab meetings. Everyone knew each other um, socially. And it just became more than just about the work. It was a lifestyle. And I absolutely fell in love with something. And I'm amazed that I was actually good at it. And, uh, and so when I was finishing up my graduate studies, there was a real question about what to, what to do. And... In the neighboring building was Charlie Janeway and Ruslan Metsatov, who at the time were identifying some of the fundamental principles of how we recognize infection. I was primarily focused on how infections execute themselves, you know, how bacteria execute their virulent strategies and then talking to people who use viruses and, you know, how viruses replicate and things like that. Um, you know, just pathogen centric. For us, a macrophage was a living petri dish. And Next thing you know, I start chatting much more deeply with, with my future postdoctoral advisor, Ruslan Metsatov, and I remember walking into his office, toll-like receptors, you know, the first pattern recognition receptors were already identified just a few years earlier. Ruslan was really the first to identify the first, but many others had come on the stage. So this was 2002. So just four years after um, tolls were, four to five years after tolls were really popping. And... You see, if you look at reviews of the literature at that time, as Cindy well knows, people would draw a generic plasma membrane with a bunch of toll-like receptors just hanging off it. (laughs) And I had asked uh, Ruslan, my future boss, and I had said, well, how do we know that there aren't the plasma membrane? Mm -hmm. And he had said, well, we don't. If you look at all the original papers on toll-like receptors, there is a kind of a schematic of what the receptors look like. There's a knockout mouse, and there's some co-IP in 293 cells. And no one ever took a picture of where the protein was in the cell. (laughs) And I was probably bothering my future boss by continuously asking cell biological questions. Because uh, let's face it, I was working on how bacteria live in macrophages. That's a cell biological problem. And um, eventually he said, well, we have a box in the corner that's got a microscope in it. Why don't you come to the lab and open it up and figure it out? (laughs) And, um, you know, so I came to the lab and... Um, you know, we started asking where are the proteins, um, toll-like receptors found in cells. And my kind of my first foray into that area was to partner with a senior postdoc in the lab, again, who Cindy knows well, Greg Barton. And, uh, and so Greg was at the time just overexpressing toll-like receptors in 293 cells, the famous cells that everyone likes to start their studies with, whether it's appropriate or not. And then he was doing flow cytometry and he said, well, I can easily detect toll 4 and toll 2 and toll 5 at the plasma membrane by flow cytometry, but things like toll 9, 
I can never see them at the cell surface, but if I permeabilize the cell, I can hmm. by flow. And I said, well, I could take pictures of the cells if you, you know, show me how to introduce these cDNAs into them. And so it was a wonderful partnership where he did all the flow cytometry, I did all the microscopy, and um, and there were many others in the field, including Cindy at the time, who were working in this area um, that ultimately started um, the nascent field of innate immune cell biology to emerge, where people moved from just genetics-only analysis to understanding where the proteins of your immune system, as opposed to the genes of the immune system through knockout analysis um, and how they how they function. And that question has been on my mind to this day. You know, at the end of my postdoc, I was this was now 2007. I was thinking about moving to various regions of the country, but really, I wanted to be on a coast because any any kid who grows up near a beach wants to be near, near a beach. And, uh, and so I ended up moving to, to Boston. And initially, the lab was focused on trying to understand, you know, where, again, toll-like receptors recognize their, their microbes, what they do after they recognize their microbes, which was largely a black box. In fact, in many ways, it still is. And then we expanded to include uh, many, of the, many of the other innate immune signaling pathways that are on the kind of the the lips of, of scientists around the around the world today, because you know once you kind of get a flavor for the questions associated with one family of pattern recognition receptors, it's very easy to start asking related questions on others. So these days, the lab is focused on tolls, the reg I like receptors that are so important to detecting viruses, the CS thing pathway, and the inflammasome pathways. And we're trying to use these lessons that we've learned in vitro to potentially inform kind of next generation. Um, vaccination approaches in the context of either infection or, or cancer. And it's it's really been a fantastic ride. I cannot believe that I have this career. It's it's delightful to me. That is an awesome story. I'm so happy to have heard that story. And um, when your lab sort of first came onto my radar in terms of different papers from your lab, um, I always linked you as the one with the beautiful microscopy images in the papers. Um, so getting to hear sort of That's where that microscopy kind. fits in is pretty cool. That's very kind. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I think it's so funny because I'm sitting here listening to that side of the story, which I don't know if we ever actually like communicated that origin story like that. But at exactly the same time, you guys were unboxing your microscope and taking pictures was when we, I, I had tagged TLR9 because that was the TLR that I was interested in and we were trying to figure out how it might interact with its ligand and where it was. And I was taking these pictures and we were doing the same thing with flow and with microscopy. And we were like, it's not on the surface. Uh -huh. Maybe there's a mutation in the plasmid or why, you know, what's going on? Or, you know, maybe it's non-functional because of the tag we put on it makes it not work. And so that's exactly, we were approaching it from a slightly different way, but it's so funny how that convergence of curiosity when a new thing like that comes on the field and then you're just trying to like do basic you know observational things and you come up with these curiosities and and just like you that kind of has driven a lot of what we think about with trying to understand how these TLRs work and and why they you know function in the various ways that they function that's pretty cool to hear that yeah it's it's interesting that that you had the same experience um when I often think about this, when, when you go back to you know 1989, when Charles Janeway Jr., the late Charles Janeway Jr. and greats, um, you know, he effectively just laid out the rules with in, almost a dataless thesis, and then said, "Okay, now yeah. go figure it out." And um, the beauty of the dataless thesis is that you can be aspirational, mm -hmm. or you can say, "I have a vision of how our immune system protects itself," which is an age-old question, and I would argue. I think many would agree that it was Janeway's um, thesis in 89 that effectively provided the bones of a molecular explanation of what the windows are that we use to see the microbes around us. And these so-called pattern recognition receptors were hypothesized at the time. And, you know, tolls, tolls emerged and, you know, other, other members of these families emerged. But then, of course, you get into the details of how they they operate. And now you get these observational disconnects, like you just described, Cindy, where you're like, well, I don't understand how come this doesn't make sense. The um, kind of the gauntlet that's laid down in 89 is effectively operating at a level above the details. So they can say, it doesn't matter how it works out, as long as the principle is there. And then you guys work on work on the details. But there's a lot of details to to effectively work out. If any of our listeners have not read that paper, 
I love that paper so much and I strongly yeah. recommend they go read it. You can put it in the <laughs> it's show. It's called yeah. Approaching yeah. the Asymptote yeah. yep. and it's in Cold Spring Harbor Labs, right? It is. Uh, yes. Yeah. It's, it's really so interesting. And one of the things I was going to ask you, so I'm glad you brought that up, is sort of how do you s- see or describe how we've evolved from that point? Because there were a number of things that he posited in that, that, that were have proved absolutely true. And a few of the things were mostly right. And there were a few things that were wrong. And so how do you, how do you feel like things have evolved since then? It did, like you say, made people think, right? Made them stop and think about the whole field differently and start to ask more um, fundamental questions and more mechanistic questions to answer or fill in all those gaps of things, um, the ideas that he put down on paper. Sure. I mean, if, it is interesting to look back at that because you can say at the time, much of it, as we said, is is prophetic. So how much of that you know, prophetic language ended up proving to be correct? So, I mean, one of the logical statements made at the time, and it's always fascinating because pr- many people believe that the most logical statements are so obvious. How did we not already know this? But until it's stated, it's not logical at all. Um, but one of the most logical statements was that all multicellular organisms face the threat of infection. These, I mean, we also know single cell organisms face the threat of infection with phage and bacteria. And so Janeway argued that nature is lazy. And if there is a solution to the problem of detecting and defending yourself that emerged in cnidarians, for example, or dogs and cats, humans are not going to reinvent the wheel because humans are lazy and just like all other multicellular organisms. And we are going to repurpose or just continue to use the same strategies that our ancestors used to detect infections. The outcome of that detection may be context specific, but either way, the outcome is defense, and that is not context-specific. So Janeway predicted that these so-called pattern recognition receptors would have siblings or grand grandmothers or grandfathers in ancient organisms. And that, in fact, did prove to be correct. As, as you know, Jules Hoffman, Bruno Lemaitre, and, and many of the Drosophila people really provided the first genetic evidence that a toll-like receptor operated as a pattern recognition receptor from their work in fruit flies. And then a year uh, later... Another spectacular paper, if you mm-hmm. haven't read that one. Yep. The, the picture of the fly with the fungi on it is just amazing. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So that prophecy, let's just say, proved correct, that our innate immune system that we use today has its origins in, you know, let's say, the basal levels of mm-hmm. multicellularity. In fact, if you look at the genome sequence, then how many genomes have been sequenced? Thousands, at least hundreds, but thousands. Every single multicellular organism has evidence of toll-like receptors inside of them. We don't all have the same number, but we have them. And most of them, of course, have not been studied. So that was proven true. Um, the other comment that was, or the other prediction that was proven true was really at the basis of what Janeway was really thinking, which was how do you stimulate adaptive immunity? And mm-hmm. at the time, the view was that there was the innate immune arm that controls infection until the adaptive immune arm kicks in, which takes longer, as if these things were operating independently of one another, just at different rates. So innate immunity acts fast, and they pray that the kind of the reinforcements of the T cells and the B cells show up. Yeah. Janeway's idea, of course, was derived from the idea that you can't vaccinate anyone with just antigen, right? You need an adjuvant. Yeah. And that adjuvant was typically ground up bacterial matter, um, mycobacterial matter in many instances. And so Janeway predicted then that what we really do in the lab is to provide an infection-like signal to our immune system that actually tells your adaptive immune system what to do. And I'm being general here, but I think... Yeah. That's, that's okay. And that statement has proven, proven itself correct, too. And I would argue that's one of the reasons why the Nobel Prize a little over a decade ago was awarded for the molecular and cellular description of the innate control of adaptive immunity. The details of what these receptors were, and Janeway didn't know, the details of what these receptors recognized, there were hints in the literature, but until you know the receptors, you can't really predict that. But I would argue that one of the most confusing things to lecture on, and I would also argue it's something that Janeway would have probably 
not expected was how common nucleic acids are as microbial ligands for these. Because his view was that the ligands for these receptors should be uniquely microbial, Hmm. things like flagellin Mm -hmm. or cell wall components. Then you could use a molecule from a cell wall as a clean if-then statement. If we bind to a cell wall component, then we bumped into a bacterium because we do not make cell walls. But of course, we all make nucleic acids. And Mm -hmm. I am, of course, predicting, but I bet that the early discussions had would have not placed on the dry erase board DNA and RNA as a likely microbial product. Despite the fact, as Vincent would know, poly IC was (laughs) immunostimulant. Yeah, so poly IC. But... One an, another tenet of his his model, though, was that it was something that would be absolutely required for survival of the organism. Indeed, right. That's very and good so point. that does fit that, mm-hmm. right? Because yes. the, the that it's actually the the most important piece of the organism mm-hmm. in order to be able to survive and replicate. Right. So, although Indeed. it didn't fit the the if then you know discre- discrimination between microorganism and host, it did fill that tenant. That's, well, that's a very good point. Yep. And, and I think that if you look at sort of the nucleic acid sensing field overall, until some of the work you guys were talking about earlier about localization um, sort of added that additional piece, mm-hmm. it was very confusing. And some of those early papers say some interesting things. Well, there were two different things going on, right? So there were the people that were studying how we recognize microbes and they weren't, like you say, John, thinking about DNA as a possibility. But then there was a whole group of people who were using DNA to trigger immune responses and hadn't put together how they were actually inducing those responses, right? And so part of what I did originally was connect those two things together and show that that was actually uh, the DNA receptor TLR9. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I had gone into my postdoc and I was like, hey, you know, what you're working on here probably is triggering a TLR because it's a stimulatory oligo and it's an adjuvant and it's doing all of these Mm -hmm. things that... Our ligands do so. Yeah, it was. It's interesting to to think about where we were then and where we are now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that for me is some of the most interesting um, aspects of the field of innate immunity, is because it is so incredibly dependent on being informed by microbial infections. Yeah, it's incredible on how intertwined these are. But sadly, many fields of study. It's not unique to immunology, but many fields of study are very siloed in the work that they yeah. that they do. And that siloing results in valuable information, not cross-fertilizing fields. And, you know, it is cliche to say that innovations are made at the interface between fields, but I would yeah. say experience validates that, that cliche. So speaking of prophecies, I think you used that yeah. word for Janeway, right? Yes. Um, you have, you recently published a hypothesis in um, science Uh, And maybe we could talk about that as a starting point. Uh, Infection infidelities drive innate immunity. So tell us the genesis of this this hypothesis. Sure. Yeah, this is something that I have been, actually many people, but I've been thinking about for, for several years. And so if you look at where we just left off with Janeway, you could say that the idea that pattern recognition receptors detect pathogens and defend us from pathogens has largely been proven out through genetic analysis, meaning that if you knock out specific toll-like receptors, the C-gas pathway, things like that, which recognize microbes, you have problems with controlling infection. And it's very clean, right? You infect an animal, let's say a mouse, the mouse may get sick, but it protects itself. If you knock out a toll-like receptor and you infect the animal, the mouse gets very sick and it potentially can die. And so based on types of experiments of that sort, you could say, well, if the microbe is the problem and this receptor protects you, protects you from that problem, that receptor must recognize the microbe. It's a very simple kind of arrow that you draw. And biochemically speaking, the knowledge that we as a community have gained over, I would say, the last 20 years has revealed the specific ligands and receptors that are detected. And that information is actually inconsistent with detecting the legitimate pathogenic entity. Let me give you a few examples. So one is what we already discussed. So 
RNA and DNA are by far the most common pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And of course, that term is accurate. Pathogens have RNA and DNA, and they are associated with the pathogenic entity. The challenge comes when we realize that many of these sensors are in, in the, facing the lumen of a lysosome, in particular the tolls. So no pathogen, I think we would agree, contains their nucleic acids on their surface. <laughs> and you can also agree that if you, relieve, if you release your, pet, your DNA and RNA into the lumen of a lysosome, that probably means that you were degraded and therefore killed. And I think we can also agree that if you're degraded and killed, you are not a pathogenic entity. So the hypothesis that I offer to the community is that, and this is just one example, that our innate immune system may actually be blind to the successful individuals within a pathogenic inoculum. The pathogen, let's just use viruses as an example, but it applies elsewhere. If a virus enters your cell and it successfully enters the cytoplasm and initiates replication, by definition, it evaded detection by a toll-like receptor. Yet, we know that if you knock out specific toll-like receptors, you have a phenotype in an animal model of infection with numerous viruses. So how are both of those statements true? The virus cannot replicate if it's killed in a lysosome. If you knock out that receptor, infection is worse. And that receptor definitively recognizes nucleic acids from that pathogenic agent. So if you, imp if you overlay or underlay those if-then statements or those, let's say, inconsistent facts with the other fact, which is that all pathogens are not equally virulent. I don't mean salmonella is more virulent than HIV. I mean within a pathogenic, within an infectious inoculum, not all pathogens will succeed in executing their virulence plans. When I was in graduate school, you know, studying Legionella, we would, because we were looking at individual bacterial phagosomes, that entered, that were present within cells, we were able to quantify how many phagosomes were formed as opposed to how many replicating niches were formed. And it was about 80%. If you grew your bacteria under optimal conditions, eight out of 10 bacteria that enter a macrophage would be able to successfully execute its virulent plans. Mm -hmm. 20 of those 100 will get stuck in a lysosome and degraded. And this statement applies to viruses too, as as we know, there is often the discussion of particle to PFU ratio in viral infections. What that means ultimately is that you're dumping more virions onto the cell than will be ultimately infectious. And so the hypothesis that I put forth is that the positioning of toll-like receptors where they are, many of them, facing the lysosomal lumen to detect an entity that would never be on the surface of a successful pathogen could best be explained if what our innate immune system is doing is waiting for mistakes to be made. Mistakes is not a scientific term, though. And we often talk about low fidelity and high fidelity polymerases, low fidelity DNA repair processes, all these things. And so the idea that I introduced was that we can consider infectious strategies in the context of high and low fidelity events as well. And so in the context of viral entry or listeria entry, for example, sometimes these pathogens will execute their virulence plans successfully. But it's not perfect. And the imperfections or these infidelities in successfully executing your virulence strategy result in your own demise. And that demise is actually what's releasing the ligands to your innate immune system. So um, in thinking about this, and I think this is really fabulous, um, I could see some sort of obvious ways I could imagine this in thinking about viral infections um, mm -hmm. and sort of defective particles, or if I think very specifically about some of the things that I think about in my lab, if say the HIV capsid wasn't formed correctly and allowed exactly. uh, nucleic acid to be accessed in the cytoplasm. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about um, the situation with other pathogens. You mentioned that when you did some of the bacterial experiments, you had 20% that didn't successfully um, complete their strategy. Mm -hmm. What do we know about that 20%? Is that a sort of defective particle? I know that's not the right word here thing, or is it just a chance 
thing or what is what's going on with those 20 percent yeah brian i think that's a fascinating question because correct me if you disagree but in the context of viral infections it's a bit easier to at least schematize what defective means because you may package half your genome so of course you're defective there is almost no understanding and in fact this is a frontier of, of biology for why bacteria would be able to successfully execute their virulence plans or unsuccessfully do so because there is no such thing as a defective particle in that in that instance we often um, in the pathog- bacterial pathogenesis community you know use you know silly terms like you know you win some you lose some but what biochemically does that actually mean we don't know why salmonella which does the same has the same problem as legionella why yersinia why um, listeria why these pathogens sometimes are able to successfully execute their plans and when i i want to be specific here when i talk about success of infection i do not mean transmittability from one host to the other because that is a population issue i'm talking about the way we draw the biological models that are in our textbooks. We draw one bug bumping into one cell, and the outcome is, in my definition, success means the microbe succeeds in executing its multiplication cycle, or the host succeeds and degrades. The interesting thing for me is that our immune system, once a pattern recognition receptor is executed or activated, The downstream consequence is systemic. You generate inflammation. In plants, you generate a hypersensitivity response. And so what that means then is that you don't really need that many mistakes to occur during an infection for you to trip the wire of the immune system to Mm -hmm. cause you to protect or to enable you to protect. You could have 99 out of 100 immunologically silent events, HIV, for example, 99 out of 100 times it gets in, completely silent, its capsid is stable, so it avoids the C-gas pathway, it enters the cytoplasm, it avoids the toll-like receptors, it goes into the nucleus, all that jazz. Mm -hmm. But one mistake triggers, let's just say, C-gas thing, and that induces inflammation, which makes it much harder for the population of microbes to execute their, their plans. And so you can... I think of this of this process as highly efficient in making sure that we're taking advantage of the inevitable mistakes that will happen or the effectively the infection infidelities that would that would be associated with any infectious inoculum. In the context of bacteria, same exact principles apply. I mean, one thing that has emerged is that bacterial virulence factors, the type three and type four secretion systems that so many pathogens use, these are very, very exciting uh, molecular syringes. The, in fact, if you look at the electron micrographs, they actually look like syringes of these. These syringes are very promiscuous in what they inject into cells. Many of them are associated with injection of cell wall components into the cell, flagellin fragments, peptidoglycan fragments, LPS fragments. And anytime that you do an infection with salmonella, with legionella, with yersinia, you always activate pattern recognition receptors in the cytoplasm that are sensing the mistaken injection of these cell wall components. When you do detect those, what happens? Pyroptosis. And you're talking about intracellular pathogens who really need the cell to live. Mm -hmm. And so the idea there with bacteria is exactly the same, that the host can wait for the bug to mistakenly inject something like a cell wall component as opposed to a virulence factor. And when it does... That is what trips the pyroptosis wire. So let me try and throw a wrench in this. Please. <laughs> of course. It, there's, as you write, there are always exceptions in biology. One, one thing is not going to explain any, everything. Indeed. There, there are some viruses, like poliovirus, that I have spent most of my life thinking about. The RNA just needs to get in the cytosol. It's naked. It's part of the reproduction cycle. If that doesn't happen, the virus doesn't reproduce. And that's where it's sensed by Rig I and MDA5. So Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be in in faithful or unfaithful or infidelity. (laughs) That's normal. That's so how does that fit into your idea? You understand what I'm saying? I do. I do. Yeah. So we've, we've chatted with a lot of um, virologists on the, on this point. So polio 
I would argue that I would benefit from your input <laughs> on. Let's use VSV, let's use HSV, and let's use rotavirus and rheovirus as examples. So VSV as Ensendai. VSV has been very nicely shown that if you purify crude preps of VSV, there will be lots of defective viral particles mm -hmm. in that prep and infectious agents, and that is highly immunostimulatory to the RIGI pathway. Right. But if you do a prep where you isolate purely, um, I'm being exaggerating at this point, but pure infectious virus, and you separate the defective interferon particles by cesium gradients, now you have a situation where the defective particles are highly immunostimulatory. The replicating virus, which of course by definition is going to be making more RNA because the virus is replicating, is almost completely immunologically silent. The same statement applies for HSV. When you, when you purify infectious HSV entities as opposed to defective ones, of course the infectious HSV will make much more DNA in an infected cell, yet it is far less immunosilent or far less immunostimulatory hmm. than the defective particles. And Rhoda and Rio, for me, are the most interesting ones because in order to successfully package the RNA from a Rio virus into the capsid, the 5' prime end cannot be triphosphorylated or diphosphorylated. It must be monophosphorylated because the viral protein that pulls the viral genome into the capsid is a monophosphate binding protein. So what that means then is that if real virus is doing its job properly, it is creating RNAs that are by definition not sensed by Rig I because Rig I can sense triphosphorylated RNA. Yet, if you infect cells with real virus, you activate Rig I. And so I would appreciate your your advice on on polio, and it could be that polio is is an exception to the to this uh, quote unquote proposed rule. But there, certainly there are examples of um, those that, that fulfill it. Well, I can tell you what, here's, here's the answer. And that is when polio enters a cell, it starts, it binds the receptor, it gets endocytosed. Mm -hmm. Within minutes before the endosomes move very far into the cell, the RNA pops out through a pore made by the virus particle. It's in the cytosol. Mm -hmm. But I'll bet you a fraction of of broken particles remain in the endosome and go further in and get sensed. And so there's where that's that's what your answer should be for, for polio and many <laughs> and many viruses like it. There are a whole bunch of them. It's not just polio, enteros and even SARS uh, coronavirus. The, the RNA is naked in the cytoplasm. And so you have to figure some 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 mess up is going on. And in fact, you know, if you try if you do the experiment that you suggested, the genetic experiment where you knock out rig I, MDA5, or TLR3, you get mm -hmm. different results in cells and culture and in mice. So we're not even sure what's sensing polio Indeed. and enteroviruses, okay? But I would say that that's what's happening. There's some capsules that remain in with their RNA cargo. They're broken in some way, and that gets sensed. And not, it's not actually what's in the cytosol that gets sensed. So it's good. Very... that would make it consistent with your, with your hypothesis. Indeed. Indeed. I will... <laughs> Absolutely use that. Okay. Thank you. So I was curious about two. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I had following up with that. Oh, I, I ha related and curiosities, like also kind of challenging your model there. Mm -hmm. How do you feel damps? Yeah, that was and Vitapamps fit in with this. So there's a model where the immune system can detect the difference between a a live and a dead pathogen through these phytopamps. This is Julie Blander's work, right? And then there's damps, which are not microbial in origin, but would be self. And how does that fit in with, uh, with your model? Sure. So we can work backwards from that. You can make the argument that... So damps are what is known as damage-associated molecular patterns. They're molecules that are released from dying cells. And so dying mammalian cells... And we know that molecules released from dying mammalian cells can be immunostimulatory. And we know that healthy mammalian cells should be immunologically silent. That statement is exactly the same thing I just made with virulent versus non-virulent or pathogen infidelity. So maybe what's really going on here is that if you are a successful pathogen or you are a successful host cell, meaning you're happy and healthy, you are capable of evading your pattern recognition receptors. But if you make mistakes 
in your viability as a host cell, your membranes get oxidized, you happen to lice, that's going to kill your ability to survive and multiply by definition. And now you stimulate a pattern recognition receptor. In the context of an infectious agent, if you make a mistake in a virulent strategy, you reveal yourself, get yourself killed, and you reveal yourself to the immune system. So it is possible that just like Janeway, who did not envision any such thing as a host inducer of pattern recognition receptors, you know, version number one of the proposal that I've offered in that, you know, the mistakes that pathogens make, not the pathogens themselves, end up being those that are detected, that could very nicely apply to host-derived damps as well. Mm -hmm. The successful epithelial cell that's on our skin right now, happy, healthy, immunologically silent. Immune evasive, if you want to say. So, but when if you say die, invasive, do you mean kind of like hiding the damp or keeping the damp inside the cell so it can't be exactly. released? <laughs> okay. Exactly. I mean, a lot of damps are exactly this. Look at IL-1 alpha, which yeah. is probably the ultimate damp. It's not only hiding in the cell, it's hiding in the nucleus. Um, but if you die, next thing you know, you're releasing entities that can be sensed by the immune system. So what about viruses that, and, and you guys would know more about this than I do, but what about the viruses that their main strategy is to burst out of cells, right? Lytic viruses. I'm intrigued by this. And I would be curious about some of the others on the calls, um, suggestions. But certainly in the context of um, some RNA viruses, Nihal Altenbanet at NIH and a few others have been doing really nice work demonstrating that some viruses that we had previously considered to be lytic may in fact be releasing boluses of virus through vesicles that are effectively spit into the face of another cell much more efficiently than they actually lice. Mm -hmm. um, it's tricky to, to think, and I also don't know what the ratio of one versus the other well, that's, is. Well, that's, that's the important thing. Uh, that, that's the important thing, because you don't know what fraction of infections uh, go that way. But uh, it, until I see more data, I say most infections, by like poliovirus and related viruses, are lytic. So, yeah, the cells mm -hmm. are breaking open, and they're releasing ligands, right? Ligands, yeah. RNAs, and proteins that can stimulate, and I think that's part of the amplification of uh, of the response for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, we, I, I we would call those successful, right? Because uh, that the, is the, the natural part of their replication. Yes, the virus has reproduced. However, it gets out of the cell. Yeah, it's now gone through a success. And by the way, Jonathan, you used the term the the the, the microbe executes their virulence plans. And then you f you corrected it later. You said reproduces because I think that's the way to look at it, right? Yes. Because at least for viruses, I don't know about bacteria, but for viruses, they don't need to be virulent. They just need to reproduce, I, right? I completely agree. And that is an important point. The I'm blending the terms virulence, which is effectively a, a clinical diagnosis <laughs> versus complete a replication cycle. Right. That, when I use the term virulence, I'm, I'm discussing that. We just call a lot of factors that microbes use to complete their replication cycles virulence factors. And that's how come the language sometimes gets blended. But even the point that you just, just made, Cindy, about you know when pathogens are leaving the host, that I think I, I need to think more, more deeply on because the focus of at least the hypothesis that we put forth is really on the initiating mm -hmm. events associated with the mm -hmm. heist microbe mm -hmm. encounter. Yeah. Vincent, I would wonder sort of speaking about all of this, um, when you have a virus that you'd consider a lytic virus, mm -hmm. um, how much of that lysis process might involve things like the pyroptosis machinery? Mm -hmm. I, that's like a good question. That. That's interesting. Yeah. I think it likely does, right? Because how else? Because yeah. eukaryotic viruses do not make lysins like phages do. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'll bet they're depending on... Uh, Pyroptosis, apoptosis, necroptosis. Uh, in fact, many very rapidly reproducing lytic viruses stimulate apoptosis to get out of the cell, I think. Right. That was going to be, so Brian, I'm glad you brought this up because the, the other thing that I was thinking about is, do you think there are situations in which the microbe wants to induce an inflammatory response? So the one I had thought of was, I'm, I'm, I should have gone back and reviewed the literature, but is, is Seth Ratkoff, now whom 
didn't he do the work where if you knock out Mighty 88, there's defection, defective repair of the intestine. And so mm -hmm. the whole idea that your microbiota needs to continuously trigger some level of immune response, some level of IgA production, some level of mucus production, some level of recognition to maintain integrity. Indeed. Yeah. How I does mean, that fit in with all of this as well? Yeah, this is this again is an, is an interesting point. So the data you just described is my recollection as well. So okay. I mean, if you knock out toll-like receptors or MIDE88, which is kind of the central regulator of many toll-like receptor signaling, you have unexpected effects in the intestine, which would suggest then that our innate immune system is in fact mm -hmm. detecting the microbes that naturally inhabit our bodies. In fact, there's a general um, let's say superficial belief that, you know, the microbes that live in our skin and the microbes that live in our intestine, we ignore. And so people in classes often ask me, and I'm sure you, you folks, how can we ignore the bacteria in our intestine, but we don't ignore the bacteria that get into our bloodstream. But these days we know in part from the work that you just described, Cindy, that we're not ignoring anything. No. The view microscopically of bugs living in the lumen of the gut and our healthy tissues underlying that next to it is not a steady state. It is a very dynamic conveyor belt, meaning if you block one, everything flows through. And we know this because if you ablate specific innate immune pathways, all of a sudden the friendly bacteria that we love to live next door to us are penetrating our intestine. Mm -hmm. And if you look at IgA that's in a wild type healthy animal, a ton of it, NIgG, is specific for commensal mm -hmm. yep. bacteria. And so there probably is no such thing as us living in harmony. We are effectively at a, at a, at a clash that is um, homeostatic, and that clash can be take taken advantage of. I mean, certainly there are instances, salmonella is one that loves to live in an inflamed intestine. And so in those instances, you could um, expect that perhaps there are pathogens that don't really care if they stimulate immunity. They may be the most host adapted. So, uh, uh, go ahead, Vincent. So, Jonathan, you, you, I wonder what you, how does, how does this fit in with your hypothesis? So, as you know, many viral genomes encode antagonists of sensing or signaling in the innate pathways, right? Indeed. And in fact, we know for, for SARS CoV 2, it has a very effective. <laughs> antagonists yeah. of, of uh, interferon, and that's why it works so well. So how does that fit in with your model? Yeah, so I would argue that this fits very nicely into it, in particular when you think of the, infected, the infectious population. So let's say that Vincent and I are two viruses, and we enter the same cell, and I'm always making mistakes. I'm very clumsy. <laughs> Yet we both have to live inside of this cell. So you may be able to deal with my mistake that activates a toll-like receptor by trading an interferon antagonist, for example, because he knows from experience that the young kids are always screwing up all the plans that, that the parents laid out. It'll cost you. <laughs> this would be my, uh, my proposal of, of why this, this, would, this would make well, sense. Well, I don't know how often, I mean, I agree that co-infections are more frequent than we think, but I don't think there's a rule. I think they're still singly but infected. Going so. back to something we mentioned before, that the triggering of a PRR stimulates an immune response against all of the population. Yeah. And so I think there would be evolutionary pressure to develop innate yeah. sensing to get around that because you know in your population you're going to have duds and you got to deal with those duds as a population. So mm. then you evolve to get around that because the inflammatory response doesn't care if you're a dud or not, you're all going to be targeted. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I'm glad that you just brought up the evolutionary question, Stephanie. Yeah, I did. I, I have a couple of questions about the evolvability because one of the things when reading, I'm thinking about the gut, I'm thinking about this concept of probably, you know, utilizing the, the, this pathway in the damp sense is helping us to clear dead cells in the gut that have to be actively, you know, um, replaced mm -hmm. and to sense cancer and things like that. But what kept popping up to me is TLR4. I had always learned that TLR4 could directly sense pathogens. And maybe I'm just not remembering the literature, but that could be something. And you mentioned in your paper that kind of takes us, um, gives us a story about the evolution of, of what's going on here. 
Exactly. So I grew up stowing, studying TOL4. It's my favorite pattern recognition receptor, and it is the one that is most easily violating the proposal that I made. In fact, <laughs> TOL-like receptor 4 is well recognized to detect bacterial lipopolysaccharides. And those can be displayed on the surface of bacteria. But they're facing the wrong way. They're facing the wrong way. I think you're still way. right. I think you're still right. You have to pluck them out. <laughs> you have to pluck in them order out. to recognize them. So say that exactly. again. So you're saying that to recognize them, the flood, the the LPS has to flip. Exactly. It has I to be. See. So the part that's sticking down in the membrane is the yeah, part that binds into now. TLR4. Okay. So it's not just you. It floats around and you recognize it. We always draw this, right? We draw a TLR4 on the surface and the bacteria binds, and I'm just like, no, no, no. It's not a phagocytic <laughs> receptor. It's yeah. but yeah, you know, you you made you made it clear the way you've written your your mm -hmm. commentary that now I understand <laughs> what I was been trying to tell students. But yeah, you have to pluck the, the it, there's LBP is lipopoly lipo lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which is a misnomer because it's actually an enzymatic function. It plucks the LPS out and then delivers it to MD2 and TLR4. Exactly. So I still don't think it violates it because um, the LPSs can like fall off as a replicating or in dead bacteria outside of cells. I think it's still... I don't think it completely violates your model. I am glad that you bring that up because over coffee, I like to push that say that this is LPS is not a, um, the LPS also fits. Um, the reason why, and I wanted to go back to the HIV thing, is we know that there are host proteins that cause infection infidelities. Trim5 is very good at breaking HIV capsids. So our immune system actually tries to ruin the replication cycles. And when they succeed in ruining those replication cycles, PRRs get activated. LBP and CD14 are analogous to TRIM5. They are working very hard to reveal PAMPs to pattern recognition receptors like, like TOL4. But the truth is that um, I often think about LPS sensing as a recent evolutionary innovation. So if you look in all fish, all invertebrates, with very, very few exceptions. There is no evidence of the CD14, MD2, TOL4 system, but there is evidence of the endosomal nucleic acid sensing toll-like receptors. And so I'm only using tolls as a reference, but the CS thing pathway is also very ancient. The reg I pathway is ancient. Um, the LPS sensing machines that we know of our recent evolutionary innovation. They just happen to be something that everyone makes their living study, including, including myself. So I, I just thought of something as we were talking about this, and uh, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this. So there's two that I think of, one with TLR5 with a recent story by Ruth Lay, mm -hmm. and a second one is decades-long information about LPS. And that is there are different structures. Some are active, Mm -hmm. Some are not active at all, and some are antagonists yes. to the same receptor. How does that fit in with all of this? It's interesting. So the microbe, let's use flagellin as a frame of reference. Alan Adiram did work on this many years ago, but more recently, as you described, there's, there's additional work. Flagellin is an outstanding inducer of innate immunity, in particular because of its ability to bind to toll-like receptor 5, although it also binds to nape. Um, they five and six in the cytoplasm. But let's just talk about TOL5. So host adapted enteric pathogens, which live within us for life, are very good at mutating their flagellin in a way that doesn't necessarily prevent binding, but affects the ability to probably dimerize and activate the receptor. Yes. So this goes to a point that I wanted to comment on with, with Stephanie's discussion about evolution, because why wouldn't, you know, the flagellin subunit that's detected by the innate immune system is hidden mm -hmm. if the flagellin is in a flagella, a flagellum, meaning that our innate immune system cannot detect an intact flagellum, which is a motility apparatus. Mm -hmm. Our innate immune system can't detect LPS, as we just described, if it's actually doing its job sitting in the outer membrane. And so when the flagellum falls apart, or when the flagellin subunits do not assemble properly in the first place, those pieces are what's detected by our immune system. So instead of just making a better system, a higher fidelity flagellar system, 
it seems that the more likely strategy is to live with the fact that we're going to make mistakes and just make our flagellin biochemically distinct so it's not immunostimulatory. And I think about this all the time. So let's go back to, to viruses. Viruses, in particular RNA viruses, are famous for having low fidelity polymerases. And we know. Uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> no. Sorry, I have to fix it. I'm sorry. Please. All, please. Poly- all polymerases are low fidelity. What's missing with the RNA viruses is correction, error correction. Okay. DNA, DNA nice. polymerases have error correction, which you may view as the polymerase, but it's a separate entity. Okay. I'm sorry. That's, that, no, no, no. That's, that's very helpful. So you can see the outcome of the replication cycle of an RNA virus is that you have a low fidelity copying of the right. genome. Correct. That I think would be parsimonious. Yeah. <laughs> the outcome of human cells multiplying their genomes results in high fidelity genome mm-hmm. duplication. And we know that mutations cause changes in cellular behavior. So the question would be, if a virus was so happy with its virulence, its, its replication strategy, why doesn't it evolve a higher fidelity replication strategy? And I would argue that the reason it does not is because mistakes allow you to explore new things. It's the same justification sure. as to why I went to a liberal arts college as opposed to a specialty school. <laughs> no, that's absolutely <laughs> correct. You have to make yeah. mistakes or you never evolve. Even humans make mistakes and that's how and we, we learn from them, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you know, if you're a specialty school person, you're locked in. You just better hope that that specialty has a career path. Well, Jonathan, they, in fact, for, for polio, we know... One amino acid that controls the fidelity of the polymerase. If you make a more faithful polymerase, it can't compete in the world. Interesting. It cannot compete against wild type virus in an animal model. So evolvability is built into the system. Yeah. I love that example because I would argue, you could say, why is it? Why would it be that the proposal that I've offered is correct? That our PRRs are wired so many different PRRs are wired, including in plants, which we haven't discussed, yeah. to detect infection infidelities. Maybe it's because, one, you can't control a mistake after it's happened. You can't predict when a mistake will happen by definition. But also, all successful virulent entities need to make mistakes in order mm-hmm. to ensure the survival of the yeah. species. Absolutely. No question about it. I mean, the beaks of a finch don't change unless you get mutations in the genes, right? So Exactly. It goes all exactly. The way back. It's very clear. I- and I'm so glad that Cindy brought up the differences in uh, LPS structure and because um, I also always really like the paper that you have from your lab about the deep sea microbes LPS. And can that be sensed? <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, this was one of um, the most fun projects that we have worked on in recent years. So I had a terrific graduate student, Anna Gauthier, who was um, very creative in the type of work that she wanted to wanted to do. And Mm. we decided that we wanted to explore how we would interact with microbes that we would have never had the natural opportunity to encounter in any sense whatsoever. So, you know, Janeway's vision was that the innate immune system should catch every possible Mm. entity. Mm -hmm. He uses the term pathogen-associated molecular pattern, but in reality, what he should have used is potential pathogen-associated molecular pattern, meaning any microbe, we're going to detect it, period. But that logic has only been tested in the laboratory with hosts and microbes that are uh, occupying the same ecological niche, Mm -hmm. us in salmonella, us in E. coli, us in some soil bacterium, for example, Burkholderia, you know, name it. What about microbes that we would never have the natural possibility of encountering. And so where do you find these? You go to Mars, that will be lovely, but you also go to the deep central Pacific Ocean, so far down that the only mammals that get down there are the ones who died. Not even (laughs) whales died this deep. And I worked with this fantastic um, collaborator, Randy Rojan at Boston University, who thankfully, um, you know, enabled this trip to the central Pacific where we can take advantage of a robot that wow. collected samples all the way at the bottom of the ocean, brought them up, and miraculously, we can culture them. Wow. And also miraculously, almost actually all of them were gram negative. And so then you could start asking questions about how do our innate immune receptors recognize LPS from bugs that we would never have had the natural opportunity to detect or encounter. And the message was that most bacteria from the deep Pacific Ocean, we are completely blind to. Mm -hmm. Most bacteria from terrestrial habitats, we see. Mm 
unless they're a virulent entity. And, uh, and so the proposal that we offered with the study that, that you just uh, mentioned, Brian, mm-hmm. is, um, is that perhaps innate immunity is, should be defined locally. There really isn't any selective pressure for us to detect every possible bacteria on Earth. There is a pressure for us to detect every possible bacteria that we live next door to. And the extension of that, which we have not been able to test, is do multicellular invertebrates that live in the deep Pacific Ocean then only detect bacteria that live down there and not E. coli? Hmm. That's a harder experiment. But I bet we make antibodies against those deep sea bacteria. I do not doubt that at all. Right. I mean, you know, we that study that we just discussed was specifically focused yeah. on inflammatory responses induced to LPS. Yeah, because making so an, you can make antibodies against things that you've never, synthetic things, right? So, indeed, indeed. Yes. So I, I would guess, Jonathan, that your infidelities are all genetically based. That be, that would be my hypothesis. None of them have to do, they all have to do with putting the wrong amino acids in and the car doesn't work as well, <laughs> right? So if, if you're talking about capsids falling apart or whatever, it's because the, the sequence is wrong which all originates with a bad polymerase error. I think that could explain agree. everything, yeah. I would agree with that. In Certainly in the context of viruses, and you could argue that mm-hmm. in the context of bacterial virulence strategies, maybe the, the sister of that is, is dynamic epigenetics. Because mm-hmm. there's been studies done looking at effector proteins that can be injected into cells by bacterial type 3 secretion systems. Wolf Dietrich Hart did a lot of this work, where you can produce heterologous proteins, GFP tagged ones. It wasn't GFP, but tagged ones. And just ask how many are injected into cells. And what you see is that the secretion system doesn't actually care how many effectors are in the cell. It's just going to pump out every single one that it possibly can. And so copy number that's naturally maybe 10 virulence factors per cell, you pump them in. The question was, well, what happens if you put 100 in the cell? Does the cell count to 10? and then stop? And the answer is no. If you put thousands into the bacterial cell, the bug will pump them all in Mm. to the host. And so I would argue that that system only works if you're kind of promiscuous and you're like an elementary school teacher, just throwing the kids out into the reset, into the yard at reset, just get all out. I want, I want my, my, uh, my free time. And, uh, and that dynamic nature may be the sister of replication infidelities. You are effectively allowing yourself to be a bit promiscuous yeah. in order to survey the, the space that you're, that you're trying to live in. And have you heard from your phage colleagues? Can we assume that your hypothesis is true and antiphage analog in bacteria? Would they I, be detecting phages in the same way that it's a, it's a infidelity of the phage that causes, you know, CRISPR, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's such a cool a cool idea, Stephanie. We haven't talked to, to phage colleagues yet. There's a few on Harvard's campus that I should um, discuss. Certainly, I've actually received a ton of emails since, since this study was um, put out with a lot of, you know, feedback saying, what about this condition? What do you think about this? Things like this. Um, certainly, and I discussed this in the, in the essay, that plant innate immunity should follow the same rules. In fact, all of the PAMPs that pale antinate immune receptors detect are effectively broken pieces of bacterial cell walls. And, uh, and in that context, then you could argue, well, the successful pathogen would not have broken cell walls. But going down to phage is, yeah, is a really I, nifty... I don't know enough about the phage replication cycle in a bacteria to know, and, and I'm assuming there are analogs in bacteria to the PRRs that we have, mm-hmm. probably lesser known. Than, than the mammalian. But I would assume that would be a neat system to test to see, uh, going back to the evolution question, and, and to see if this holds true for bacteria as well. Yeah, I wonder, I wonder about that. I mean, there has been, in the, I would say the last five years, just an explosion of new antiphage innate immune systems that have been identified. Yeah. And so you can argue that the reason why, the, at least the concepts that that we're discussing today are happening now as opposed to 20 years ago is because first you need to know what the genes are yeah. that sense and, and, and execute. And then you have to understand the biochemistry of those interactions. And only when you start looking at the biochemistry can you start saying, well, maybe we need to refine the way we view the system as a whole. And so because the new antiphage systems are so numerous, I mean, it's like every other month is one that's come out, I would argue that perhaps we just need to gather a more basic 
gather some more basic info before we can have this have this discussion. Sure. Yeah, I was just thinking of what kind of experiments you could do. I mean, this is a hypothesis, so it needs to be right mm. tested. Mm -hmm. The polio Indeed. system could. I mean, unfortunately, it's hard to work on polio, but can you can un imagine we have a polymerase that makes fewer mistakes and maybe not as good at being sensed by exactly. Yeah, team. I would be super interested in that. Uh, I mean, the other thing that comes up with this is let's think about this from a from a drug development perspective just for mm -hmm. just for a moment. So. What is the classic way to identify antibacterials? It is to grow bacteria on petri dishes and see if your chemical can kill them, like ampicillin, for example. <laughs> there could be numerous chemicals that are out there that somehow mess with replication of the, or multiplication stability of the cell wall to the point where you may not have a strong phenotype in terms of killing the bacteria, but you release PAMPs and let the yeah. immune system yeah. deal with the bacteria. And the same exact thing applies to viral entry inhibitors. There are, you know, tons in discussion, right? If you're studying viral entry into a Vero cell, which doesn't have much of an innate immune system at all, your viral entry inhibitor will absolutely identify blocks in replication. But if you do that experiment in an immune cell, you may reveal that certain entry inhibitors release PAMPs, and now you get double bang for your buck. You're blocking the efficiency of entry, and you are releasing PAMPs that stimulate protective immunity. And I think all of us would agree that the ideal medicine would be one that not only kills the problem you're facing, but stimulates the immune system to remember that problem when it comes back. And this is actually what happens with chemo, with cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Like years ago, you would say, I'm going to use chemo, you know, irradiation, replication inhibitors to prevent the cancer cell from multiplying, just like an antibiotic for bacteria. But these days we know that the best chemos are those that activate sting. And what that means then is that there's already a clinical history of the benefit of using a anti-cancer drug that stimulate, that causes quote unquote damp release to stimulate immunity. Why not have the same argument or the same justification to study anti-infective biology? Yeah, and I guess into, there would be a threshold of immune activation that that probably a drug company would be comfortable with depending on the side effects. So like interferon could be a good example, but of course, giving people interferon is very hard on them. I guess chemo is the same thing, but of course, for cancer, we accept the side effects. Indeed, indeed. Of course, there's massive, um, let's say, regulatory and toxicology considerations as well. Yeah, but the, yeah. the vision would be to let the cells that are dealing with the microbe also be the source of the cytokines and, mm -hmm, and right. the signals that, that induce host defense. So effectively creating anti-infectives that cause infection infidelities, that for me will be a something that we probably have already done. We're just not thinking about it in the same way. We just don't know that's how it worked. Yes, exactly. Well, I mean... <clears throat> Molnupiravir causes infection fidelity. Hundred <laughs> percent, exactly. Like there are there are case study poster child examples. I'm just overlaying a different I language understand. here. But in, yeah. yeah, in reality, we already have evidence to support this. Although it's interesting, Molnupiravir's effect is because it stops reproduction. Right, you completely mutate the genome from being able to proceed. Maybe you don't need such a big hammer. Maybe for your idea, you could, you make some defective viruses and that's enough to stimulate right maybe you need a uh, a less potent mutagen something like that indeed yeah you know, know what I so said. this is the first kind of hypothesis paper you you've published how have you uh so it sounds like a lot of people have been contacting you mm -hmm. what has been surprising to you what are some of the outcomes of of publishing this work this write-up sure um one outcome is that it makes me wonder whether I should just publish hypotheses. <laughs> I think, you know, some of you folks would have the same experience. Usually you, you know, you blood, sweat and tears, you put through multi years of publishing a study and you get two people write you and say, nice paper. <laughs> and, uh, and so this has attracted much more, much more attention. And I think one of the reasons why is, is because it, it is philosophical. I mean, it's database, but it's, it's philosophical in, in the way I'm, I'm offering to potentially explain some of the knowledge we already have. I haven't received pushback in terms of this makes no sense and I disagree with you. I have received a lot of feedback of folks saying, in reality, this makes a lot of sense 
and we've been thinking about this perhaps just not with these terms and with this holistic framework at, as you're, you're offering. And for me, I think that is, that is satisfying. I mean, this was something that was an idea that I had presented in lab meeting in my labs when I always keep myself on the, the lab meeting schedule and I give a chalk talk every oh, few cool. months. And the chalk talk is designed one to show trainees what a chalk talk looks like if they want to go in the job market. Cause that's often the most nebulous part of the, of the job prospects prospects process. Um, but it's also my idea of pitching proposals to the, to the lab. And I've been running my lab for 15 years. I think never has anyone ever taken <laughs> the proposal that I offer. But, uh, but this one I did uh, you know, just before COVID hit and kind of presented this idea. And then shortly after that, I presented the idea to Harvard's microbiology um, faculty during one of our faculty chalk talks as well. And so you know, we've been thinking about this problem for for quite a while. And I think it, you know, one of the benefits, if there is such a thing of a global pandemic, is that it allows you to, mm. to step back and ask, like, what, what does my data mean? What does my career mean? And is there a way of potentially guiding the work that we do with a an overarching hypothesis as opposed to what we typically do, which is to just follow our noses? All right. That's great. That's uh, Immune65. If you want to send us questions or comments, immune at microbe.tv. If you enjoyed our work, consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today from Harvard Medical School, Jonathan Kagan. Thanks so much for joining us. It was a great uh, discussion, Jonathan. Thank you all. This was terrific. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langles at Case Western Reserve University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Thanks, John, for coming on. My pleasure. Brian Barker is at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. And thank you so much, John. This was fascinating. It's you and Cindy's jam. You love yeah, it. Yeah, it was very much <laughs> <Definitely>. my jam. <laughs> jam. <laughs> It was a super time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. Music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. <laughs>